You know the scripture very well, but this is what I feel like on my heart this morning. John chapter 3 and verse 3. You cannot get any more fundamental than this message. But you can't get to heaven without this message. So something familiar may not be altogether bad. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. You have to. For what? I don't want to. I don't have to. Nobody can make me. You're right. But if you want to go to heaven, you must be born again. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. For your presence, we thank you for the beautiful song this morning, the message in the song. Glad for our Heavenly Father that's looking and longing and waiting for us to come back home. Waiting for the prodigal to turn around and come back to the Father's house. How you love your children today. We're all your children by right of creation. But Father, since sin entered the picture, we have been separated from God. Spiritual death has settled in on the human family. And Father, therefore, it necessitates that we not only know you as creator, but we have to know you as savior. We have to know you as our redeemer, God, our savior. And we ask you this morning to reveal yourself in this capacity to every one of our hearts again this morning. And we will praise your name. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to give you four benefits of the new birth this morning. Four benefits of being born again. Of course, we've already said you can't go to heaven without it. That, that, we won't even use that one. That would be number five if we had five. But you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. You cannot go where God is. You cannot be where light and love and eternal health will be forever and perpetual. You cannot be there. You cannot go and visit with the saints of the ages. You cannot be able to sit down in eternity and talk to Abraham and Isaac and Noah and Jacob. You'll not be able to talk to Daniel about how it was to be in the lion's den. You'll not be able to share with Elijah how it was like to ride on the fiery chariot of God. You won't be able to visit with the saints of ages. And that may mean some of your loved ones. That may be a mom or a dad, a grandma or a grandpa. It may be a brother or sister. It may be a husband or a wife even that you would not be able to spend eternity with if you don't choose to go to heaven. Wouldn't that be sad? Is that we would not go where the saints of all the ages are going? That we would not choose to go where the redeemed of the Lord are going to be blessed forever and forever? Friend, you cannot go to heaven. You cannot see the kingdom of God except you come to this place where you're willing to let Christ give you a new birth. It is a fundamental step in our salvation. It is essential to getting to heaven. Ye must be born again, Jesus said to Nicodemus, who was a religious man, a man that had a degree in theology. He was on the Sanhedrin. He knew the law. In fact, Jesus uh, questioned him, Art thou a master of Israel? Are not you one of those that are supposed to be telling others how to get to God and how to live? And you don't know these basic truths yourself? My, that was quite a strong rebuttal to this teacher, this uh, church official. But I want you to know this morning there are four great and grand and glorious benefits to the new birth. Number one is life, yes. spiritual life, spiritual life. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life. Now, he was talking to dead people, right? I mean, he was in a graveyard looking at tombstones when he was saying that. No, he was talking to people that were breathing. He was talking to people that could see and hear like you can see and hear. But he said, I'm come that you might have life. 
spiritual life. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, And you hath he quickened, who was what? Dead in trespasses and sins. Friend, we're not alive if we're not saved. You say, I'll argue that one. There's more than physical life. You're not just a physical being. You also was made and were made to be a spiritual creature. One that could commune with God. One that can fellowship with God. And God is a spirit. And they that worship Him must do it in spirit. You can't commune with God without the new birth. You cannot have this spiritual life without the new birth. For it is a birth. It is a giving of life. The very Word expresses it clearly that the very first benefit of being saved is that you become alive to God. John said we can know that we've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. There is a long distance between death and life. Do you know that? That is an expanse that no man of his own ways and doings has the power to traverse from death to life. If it could be so, the graveyards would be empty. If man could span the distance between death and life, there would never be a funeral. Because I've never met anybody that really wanted to die. There were some that were ready to die. There were some that were ready to go to heaven. There were some that were ready to get out of the suffering. But friend, no one really wants to leave family and friends and what we know to be tangible here because even the Christian is taking a big step of faith into what is seemingly unknown except what the Word of God reveals us that heaven's going to be like. And we can trust that this morning. But that great distance between death and life can only be spanned and traversed by the power of Jesus Christ to save you. And it should be in our heart a desire to be alive toward God. I don't want to be spiritually dead. I don't want to be spiritually dull to where I can't hear the voice of God. I can't commune with God. I can't have the the wonderful privilege of being one of His own so that I can have the access and freedom to, to speak to Him and visit with Him and the joy of His presence. Friend, the joy of His presence, it spoiled me for the world. It really did. I, I, you know, it wasn't the rules and regulations. I didn't know all those. <laughs> it wasn't necessarily the atmosphere in the sense that, you know, it was just poor people there at Anawal. They were just basically poor people. I wasn't bettering myself socially necessarily. In that sense of the word, if we rate success as money and position and, and possessions, which we don't, but as the world looks on, They might come in here and say, my, just another bunch of average people. I'm not going to help myself getting acquainted with this group of people. But they don't know who we are. They don't know who we belong to. They don't know that we've passed from death unto life. That we're alive. I hope you're alive this morning. But if you're alive toward God, you've had a new birth. (laughs) Because every one of Adam's race enters into this world spiritually dead spiritually dead. And it's only by the prevenient grace of God that we can even sense the presence of God enough to come to Him to get saved. Friend, we're so dead we can't even know we're dead. Sin is so blinding that some don't even know how steeped in sin they are and how bound and fettered and how blinded their eyes have become. They don't even realize it this morning because dead people don't realize their circumstances. But I'm glad I'm not dead. I know where I'm at. I'm conscious of my surroundings. (laughs) Praise God, I can sense and know and feel the touch of God this morning. Can you? Sense and know and feel. What a benefit to be able to sense and know and feel the touch of God in your own heart. You say, well, I'm not blessed right at the moment. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a consciousness deep within your soul that Jesus has saved you and you know you're saved. 
It's not a current blessing I'm talking about. It's a, it's a conscious assurance within your own heart that you've passed from death into life. You know when it happened. How many of you believe that anyone could have convinced old Lazarus that he hadn't been dead? I tell you, I want to talk to that boy when I get to heaven. What was it like to lay there for four days? What kind of state of consciousness were you in, or were you conscious? Were you, was your spirit in paradise, in Abraham's bosom, awaiting the resurrection of Jesus? What went on, Lazarus, while you were in that grave? And Lazarus, how did it feel? How did it feel, Lazarus, when you heard that sweet voice of Jesus call your name? Friend, let me tell you, I can almost tell you how it felt. Because I could tell you, I was sitting on that side of the church on a Saturday night when the Lord Jesus called my name. And though I was not in a tomb encased and embalmed and wrapped in linen cloths, but I want you to know my sin was bound, had bound me up and had wrapped my mind and soul. But I heard a voice that said I could be free, that I could pass from death unto life. Praise God, I am glad for this benefit. Just to be alive spiritually. Yes, sir. Just to be alive spiritually. You can live your life for the physical. You can live your life for the temporal and gratification of the fleshly body. But if you do, friend, you're missing the greater part of life. The better part of life are the spiritual blessings. The spiritual communion we have. And truly, this is a new birth. Secondly, it is a new creature. It's a conversion. The Bible talks about it in Matthew 18, 3. Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Here we have that same clause almost, that same phrase. You can't enter into heaven except you be born again. Part of being born again is a conversion that takes place in your life. And friend, these things take place awful quick. There's no way I could d differentiate in my experience when each little segment happened, but the Bible teaches us that this is what happens when we give our heart to God. We are changed. We're converted. Now, if you convert water to steam, you've changed it, right? If you convert fractions to decimals, you've changed it. If you convert out there on the pole and take that uh, whatever 7,000 volts, whatever 5,600 volts that's on the main line out here, and you run it into a transformer and you convert it down to 220, you can use it. It's been changed. And friend, when God gets through with the human heart in the new birth, it's, con it's changed. It's changed. It's different. It may be the same. It's the same natural elements, just like water and steam are basically the same thing. They're in a different state. Right. And we're basically the same person outwardly. We look the same and, and you know, we're going to have the same, probably like the same diet. I've never gotten over cornbread. I love it. I loved it before I got saved. I still love it. Some things about us does not change. But friend, there were things that were changed in my life that night. When I met Jesus, there was a conversion. There was a change. And when you meet Jesus, there will be a change. And it will be for the better. Things that are high, things that are noble, these have allured my sight. Why, friend? Because there was a conversion. There was a change. Brother Speaker spoke about it in Sunday school as he talked about his former lack of desire to be in church. And then when Jesus puts something in our heart, there is a love for church. Till you can go to camp meeting and sit through three services a day and two special prayer meetings. And still love it. You may get weary in body, you may get tired physically, but your heart is thrilled because that is where your soul is getting fed. That is where the new life flow comes from. And you take as much interest in your spiritual life now as you did maintaining physical life before. But a great benefit this morning is the change to revert morally, brought about by conviction and produces contrition which brings about a godly sorrow for sin, which makes repentance possible. Friend, we can't do these things without God's help. That's right. That's right. 
And if God just grabbed you by your little pinky and began to twist it and say, tell me you're sorry. Like you do your kids, you know. When they do something wrong, you may grab them by the arm and, and you put a little more pressure and a little more pressure and say, you're sorry. Tell your sister you're sorry. Is it real? Not when it's pinched out of them. <laughs> No, it's not real, and God doesn't twist our arm. But He helps us to feel bad about it. He helps us to feel sorrowful for our sins. When we get under conviction and it begins to produce contrition, which is brokenness and humility and a willingness to say, I'm sorry, and friend, that's what God wants to do. That's why the prodigal son came home, not with the arrogant head, I'm back home, Dad. I want the car keys again. He didn't come back saying, Dad, I want my old room back. I want my allowance doubled. Prodigal didn't come home that way. Brother Lloyd Campbell called him prod for short when he, when he preached on this message of the prodigal son. He said, prod, prod didn't do that, friend. Let me tell you, prod didn't do that. He came back a different individual than he left. He went away demanding. He came back humbly imploring his father to just let him have a little part somewhere. That's right. And friend, that's the change that conviction and contrition has to work in our heart before we can ever get to the new birth and be converted. So I don't want to humble myself. I don't want to cry in front of everybody. I don't want to tell everybody I've been mean and ugly. There's one door in the ark, friends, and there's one way to Jesus, and that's confession and forsaking of sin and repentance, and it's the way to get to God. It's the way to get the change in your heart. It's the way to get the joy bells ringing in your soul. You must go down before you can be lifted up. You must humble yourself before you can be exalted. You must be abased before you can abound. That's God's way. So I don't like it. You'll never be saved. You can have it your way. God will let you be proud and haughty and cocky and have it your way and kick the doors down in your life and do it your way, but you'll never go to heaven, friend. Is it worth it? Is it worth it not going to heaven? Is it worth it being spiritually dead all your life? Is it worth it going through life without the favor of the presence of Almighty God? One you can talk to, one you can pray to, one that can meet your needs, one that can satisfy the inner longings of your soul, one that can erase the guilt of your mistakes. Is it worth it going through life without Him? I say not. A conversion is one of the great benefits of the new birth. There's a change. Blessed be His name. Thirdly, there is a justification that takes place. And that's kind of the legal side of the transaction where God takes a guilty sinner. Not only gives him an executive pardon, that's part of it. But friend, he actually takes and erases the record. If you're a convicted felon, you might receive a pardon and get out of jail. But your record, your record, you may get out early for good time, good behavior. You may serve your time and spend your, pay your debt to society and come out and think that everything should be different. But friend, you're still an ex-convict. You still did time in prison for your crimes. You're still going to face the reputation. Aren't you glad that in justification God can blot out those things in our life, as far as God is concerned, the record is clear. I call that a new slate. Praise God. There's no way you can get a new slate with this old world. Because people don't forgive. And most people don't forget. But I want you to know there's not, that God is not like that. Acts 13, 38 and 39, Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that... Through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things. <laughs> 
from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. It, there was still, the Hebrew writer said, even with the sacrifice of blood, there was still a remembrance of sin. Did he not say that? It could not make the, the worshiper perfect. It could not blot out his record. It could not remove the guilt. It gave an atonement. It paid the penalty for it. But it could never, ever make that conscience clear. I want you to know there is one, and it's a great benefit of salvation this morning, that can take and wipe the guilt away, wipe the stain away, remove it as far as the east is from the west. So far hath He removed our transgressions from us this morning. There is a privilege this morning, church, that we have, that we are justified freely by His grace. Turn over to the fifth chapter of Romans, the great grace chapter, the great justification by faith chapter, and you read the words like this, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Oh, friend, when we were yet without strength in due time, verse 6, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, but yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Look at verse 9. Much more then, much more then than Christ dying for our sins, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Friend, our sins will either be pardoned and go before us to judgment in the light of Calvary's blood, or they will come behind us to cause us to be condemned at the judgment bar of God. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have your sins judged in the light of mercy? To be justified and the record cleared and your past blotted out. You said it doesn't seem right that God would do that. Friend, when God forgives, He forgives. And it'll never be remembered against you anymore. If you got saved and then you blotted out all those records in the past, and yet you backslide, the only thing that's on your record is from the time you backslid forward. That's right. That's right. God doesn't hold the old ones. He doesn't bring them back up. They were justified. They were cleansed and pardoned and removed from you. Praise God this morning. I'm glad that we can be justified freely by His grace. Romans 3.24 says, being justified freely. By His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You know, some have gotten to the point that their sin doesn't bother them. They've reached a state of life, evidently, where their guilt does not make them feel guilty. Their wrongs do not plague them, does not haunt them, does not bother them. You know, that's a dangerous, dangerous place to be. To have a conscience that's not working. Friend, we need to draw nigh to God in this hour because justification by faith will deal with sin in the only way that it can truly be dealt with, and that's by the blood of Jesus. Praise His name this morning. But not only do you have life, new life, spiritual life, not only has there been a new creature made, and Paul talks about that in Corinthians. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. That's not just the same old one with makeup. This is a new creature in Christ. You're different. You've been converted. And then you've been justified. All in one swoop? Yep. And we're not done yet. There's one more grand and glorious thing that happens when we get saved. When we're born again, there's a transfer of kinship. There's a new relationship. We enter into a new family. It's called adoption. Galatians 4, 4 through 7. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, 
God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Oh, I'm glad for this adoption. I'm glad from the door of an orphanage to the house of a king. No longer an outcast, a new song I sing. From rags unto riches, from the weak to the strong. Not worthy to be here, but praise God, we belong. Huh? I'm a child of the king. I'm a child of the king. Friend, there has been an adoption that takes place when we give our heart to God and the new birth takes place and the Spirit stamps His seal of authenticity on our heart that the work is done. There is a new relationship established. You're no longer an outcast and an alien. You're a child of the king. Sons and daughters, John said in 1.12, but as many as received him, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Do you want to be a son of God? Would you like to be an heir of God? He said, I'd like to be an heir of Bill Gates. That'd be all right for the paycheck purposes, but for eternal purposes, I'd rather be an heir of God. You'd be better off to be an heir of God. Why, preacher? Look at the billions of dollars I would inherit if I was Bill Gates' only heir. Sure you would, friend, but you may miss heaven. But in this case, we've become the sons of God. And our Father, our Heavenly Father, will welcome His sons into His eternal home. He'll welcome us home one day, friend, from the door of an orphanage to the house of a king. I want you to know this morning that this is a grand benefit. This is a glorious benefit. We're no longer just, just grasshoppers in His sight. That's what the Old Testament said. How's that make you feel to know you're a grasshopper in God's sight? That doesn't do much for one's ego, does it? I mowed the field out there the other day, and I mean to tell you there was thousands and thousands of grasshoppers. They'd almost swarm you as you'd make a pass. And I wonder, wonder if there's a market for grasshoppers. If I could sell grasshoppers, I could make enough money to change tractors. If they were worth anything. But grasshoppers, I don't think, are worth very much. So in the Old Testament, we have us revealed as grasshoppers. In the New Testament, Jesus wants us to be sons. <laughs> wants you to be a son of God, a daughter of God, a child of the King. What a privilege this morning. And it all happens in the new birth. You can't become a son of God any other way than be born one. I said, Mommy and Daddy, we're sons and daughters of the King. I'll be God's grandchild. Won't work. God don't have any grand youngins. He don't know what he's missing. From a filial standpoint, from a human standpoint, grandchildren are wonderful. But grandchildren don't exist in the kingdom of heaven. You have to be born in. You have to become a son. You have to become a daughter. But you can. Thank God He wants you to be a son. Behold what manner of love, 1 John 3, 1, the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. What manner of love He bestowed upon you to make you His son. And it does not yet appear what we shall be or what we are. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we, that, we know that when we, He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. You know, I'm glad. I'm glad God's in the adoption business. It's a good thing for some children and some orphans that there were humans that had compassion. Is it not true that there have been a many a kid left at a home, a group home somewhere, had it not been for a loving, compassionate family and couple that saw that little child, and maybe it wasn't the most proportionate little child, maybe it wasn't the most intellectually astute little child, but yet they loved that child and had compassion and adopted that baby and gave it a home and gave it warmth and love and nurturing and food and clothing and shelter and took care of it. Isn't that a wonderful family that would do that? How great is our heavenly parent this morning 
that would look upon us and with our shortcomings. And God would still be willing to adopt us into his family. There's some things that has to take place, friends, in our heart before we can really become the sons of God. There has to be life imparted to us, spiritual life. There has to be the necessary change because God doesn't house any rebels. You're in the Father's house because you want to be in the Father's house. Rebels are free to leave. God doesn't house any rebels. They're welcome to turn around and come home, but not with the rebellious attitudes. They have to have a change of heart, a conversion. Because God is holy, he has to deal with their sin. And because Jesus died for your sins, God can holy, in a holy manner, justifiably so, blot them out because your substitute took the penalty for all those sins that were in your record. And God can justify you freely. And then, friend, all in one fell swoop, <laughs> all in just a moment's time, seemingly, God can do all of that. And then he said, son, I've drawn up the papers. I've drawn up the papers for your adoption. You can be my child. Father, I'm coming home. Do you want to be alive? Do you want to be different? Do you want to be converted? Would you like to be free from the guilt of the past? Would you like to be a child of God this morning as we stand? Heads bowed and eyes closed for just a moment. It's 20 to 12. The roast is not going to burn. Thank God one is on the way. <laughs> Praise God. Who else this morning? Father, I'm coming home. <laughs> tired of being dead. I'm tired of being guilty. I'm tired of being ungodly. I want to change in my heart, Lord. I'm ready to say I'm sorry. I'm ready, Lord, to come home. Who else this morning? Quickly. Quickly this morning, you'd mind the spirits wooing. Mind the spirits wooing this morning. Let us pray with you. Let's get to God. Let's get this matter taken care of so that you can go to heaven, friend. You, you have to go to heaven or you'll burn in hell and you don't want to do that. Who else will come this morning? We're tearing just a moment. Tearing just a moment. Amen. Don't you feel the Spirit tugging on your heart? Are these benefits you'd want back in your life? Who else this morning would come and let us pray with you? He said, I've wandered far, far. Friend, it wouldn't take God long to get you back where you need to be if you'll start making some steps this direction. He can change your heart. You said, I'm not broken. I'm not, I'm not humbled right now. Come and pray about it. Come and ask God to humble your heart. He can break your heart. He broke my heart sitting in the pew. It melted down, friend. It crushed. God melted my heart of stone. He can melt your heart of stone. Ask Him. Lord, I want this and I want it. I want the benefits of being born again. And I believe there's several others that need to be at this altar this morning. You need to make a move toward God. Won't you come this morning? We could have a song. We could have music. But we had the song first. The invitational number was sang first. Anyone else like to join us at this altar this morning? All right. Christians, let's gather in and pray. Thank God for duty here this morning. Praise God. It's so good to see him coming home. Amen. Gather in for prayer.